next and last speaker is someone who's very popular with this group, that is Dr. Michael Schaefer, the founder and director of Warm Heart Foundation, which does a lot of good in this country and elsewhere. But he's here today mostly to talk about how their organization is about the only one I know of who is working very hard every day to stop the smoke. Michael. Well, I really like that uh, conclusion there that you should all wear N95 masks. You absolutely ought to. We can't afford to continue to breathe the smoke. But uh, I also want to thank all of you for all that the Ching Mai Fats Club has done for Walmart and for people of Northern Thailand. We routinely benefit from the kinds of things that you all do to provide assistance to us and to the organizations we work with. So we really want to say thank you very much before I get started here. And anyways, it was a fantastic presentation. Lots of information, really well organized. I'm not going to be that way, okay? I have to, I'm, I'm, I've got directions, like the stage directions to, to stay in place. I usually wander around rather a lot. Okay. So Walmart has been working for the past three, four years to try and stop the smoke. Our mission really is to quite literally stop the smoke. We are not interested in taking it out of the air, which is always impossible, very expensive, and there's a big chance that you're going to breathe a lot of it before it gets taken out of the air, right? So our idea is, what can we do to make sure that the smoke just never happens? Now, um, the first thing I want to do, though, is to remind you that although we experience the smoke very personally, right, this is a global problem. We are by no means the only people who suffer from this issue, okay? This is something that um, we all around the world suffer, okay? We have it here now, but just a few months ago, the government of India literally closed because farmers were burning the leftovers from their wheat crop. Before that, Tehran and, and Iran and all of the Middle East, of the Near East closed down because farmers were burning their waste there. Soon, it's going to be Myanmar and over into Vietnam. Then by midsummer, the problem is going to be in Beijing where they're burning the central and southern Chinese rice plantation areas. Then you got kind of the break in the Pacific, then it's Mexico, Bolivia, and so on. Then you got the Atlantic, but then Africa burns from the west all the way to over to the east, to the east. Then you've got Iran again, and then you've got India again, and then you've got us. So the problem is that we live here in this basin of Chiang Mai, and we see the fires in the mountains around us because the people who own the fields that are right around us here are very rich. They have big tractors. They can afford to just plow everything under, right? That's not a problem. But the problem is when you get up into the mountains where the slopes are literally up to 45 degrees, if you had the money to have a tractor, you could not drive a tractor up there. It would just tumble down the side of the mountain, right? Not a, not a going proposition, okay? So what we're really talking about here in Northern Thailand is the same thing we're talking about all the way around the world. We're talking about the consequences to all of us of the poverty of the small farmer, okay? It is not an insignificant problem, right? Here in just in Northern Thailand, thousands of people die every single year. We don't see that. But up in the mountains, we do constantly. Northern Thailand, Chiang Mai, much as we love it, has the highest infant mortality rate, the highest rate of heart attacks, of strokes, of rest COPD, of you know, 
early, uh, early premature death of elders and so on, any place in Thailand. I mean, this is this, this should not happen. This is not an industrial area. This is not an area where there are big, ugly factories. No, this is a place which should be wonderful to live in. Why do we have this problem? Because of the crop waste burden. Tens of thousands of people are admitted to hospital. If you look at hospital admissions, they go along like this, and then they go, mm -hmm, and then they go on flat again, right? Uh, it costs a huge amount of money. I mean, the hotel industry alone is estimated to lose roughly 12 billion baht every single year in bookings, okay? And that is not talking about all of the other related industries, travel, car rentals, all the tuk-tuk drivers, all the taxi drivers, all the waiters, waitresses, and so on. They get hammered. It costs the national GDP of Thailand 1%. Now that is a big number, okay? So here it's a really big problem. I like trying to make things look like something you can understand. Roughly a million tons of corn is grown here just in the north. And that is a lot, okay? That's five and a third 747s. That is a really big amount, okay? The problem isn't how much it is, it's the problem is that a lot of it gets burned, okay? So the problem with corn is that it's an exceptionally dirty crop, okay? It's dirty in the sense that if you take a corn plant, 20% of it, okay, one-fifth of it is actually the corn that a pig can eat, okay? Because we're really talking about chicken feed corn. We're talking about what we call hog corn back where I grew up, okay? 80% of that is going to be waste and it's going to end up in somebody's field, okay? That's what's getting burned. And burning that produces 6,200 tons of haze. That doesn't look like a big number, does it? 6,200 tons. I mean, I got trucks that weigh almost that much, okay? Think about it this way, okay? One kilogram, one kilogram of smoke. Pretty hard to think about, right? What's a kilogram of smoke, all right? Well, one kilogram of smoke is the same 71,429 cigarettes. That's a big number, okay? Now, if you take 6,200 tons, that's 62,000, okay, kilos times 71,429 is a number too big for me to read you know, just like right now, okay? But that's a lot of cigarettes, right? And that is also a lot of haze, and that happens every single year, okay? And we breathe an awful lot of it, because each one of us breathes a lot every single day. But what is the real problem? The real problem is you guys, right? You are all articulate, you all read, you all clearly pay attention to the issues, and what do you do about the problem? Absolutely nothing useful, right? Complain, 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 complain. Here are you guys. Oh, it's them, oh, it's them. It's this, it's that. You don't actually do anything, okay? And you get this little tiny, tiny, tiny NGO up north of here, an hour and a half, Walmart. My wife and I and half a dozen or so relatively uneducated Thai staff members trying to stop the problem. And all of you are sitting here bitching and moaning and so on. Once that it's time to shut up and do something. But now, y'all sitting here thinking, well, what are we supposed to do about something that big? Well, forget about them doing anything. There is no them out there, okay? The government is not going to do something about this. The UN is not going to swoop in and do anything about this. God knows the American government is not going to swoop in and do anything about this. It's us. 
we have to do something about this ourselves. And the really important thing is, and I saw the little baby over there, right, is that all big problems, and you guys' big problems, start really small, right? There's nothing like having a kid and then having a kid turn into a teenager to discover that big problems start small. I raised a lot of teenagers, okay? <laughs> So here we are, this guy, that little schmo right there, he's the source of all of our problems. You go out there and try and figure out where's all that smoke coming from. It's coming from guys like that. Little tiny farmers with little tiny farms who've got no choice to clean their fields but to whip out Mr. Bick. Remember those ads when, when, when we were all younger? Mr. Bick, you know, and uh, click a bit. They click a big boy and boom, man, that corn waste goes away. They're ready to plant. It's wonderful, except for the fact that we all end up smelling smoke. Now, how come this just keeps going on and on and on? Why doesn't the government know it's happening? Well, you know, you've all seen the satellite photographs. One of the big places where we work is May Gem. 110,000 rye of corn, okay? Huge amount. Last year, the government gave them an award because they said, oh, you didn't have any hot spots this year, meaning you didn't have any big fires. But a study revealed that 41% of the cornfields got burned. So somebody said, well, how'd you do that? And the farmer said, well, we had all the satellites go over it. So these are not your dumb old, you know, this is not your old-fashioned farmers. These guys are pretty sophisticated, right? They, you know, they're okay, so they don't have fun. Okay, so the satellite just went over, it's your turn to burn. Okay, I get, get your fire out, quick, 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 come on, hurry up, hurry up. Satellite's coming back, right? Okay, so they, they work on that. So who's the problem? The problem is the little guy. Why is the little guy a problem? The problem is the little guy because there are 2.5 billion of these little guys all around the world, okay? Here in North Thailand, probably two-thirds, maybe two-thirds of the population is, um, is little guys, right? This is a really big problem. We're talking about a population here in the north of maybe We're talking about a population in North Thailand of about 11 million, and probably something in the order of two thirds of them are little guys like this. So we got a lot of little guys who are in the process of burning. Why are they burning? They're burning because there's no alternative for them, and nobody's thinking about an alternative for them. But there are lots of alternatives for them. We have to come up with one of them, right? What do they need to stop burning? They need a little money. If you look at those fields out there that go like this, you just think, what do we take? They finish harvesting in December, right? January's not so bad, but think about the hot season. It's 42 or 43 degrees. That's 103 to 105 degrees Fahrenheit for those of you who are from the States, right? It is really hot in those fields. Think about what it means to work on a slope like that, cutting that stuff down and bundling it up. That's what you're going to try and do to clear those fields. That's why it's a whole lot easier to do it with a bank, okay? All right, so the problem is, he's not gonna get paid for doing that. There's no return to him in doing that. It's much better for him to go somewhere down south, to Sokla, to work in the shrimp beds, and shrimp ponds, right? Or go down and work on a rubber plantation, a sugar plantation, whatever. So that's what he's gonna do, unless he can make money doing this. Well, why shouldn't we pay him? We know it's gonna cost six billion dollars a year to pay the health care costs of people affected by this move. We know it's going to cost 12 billion baht a year for the hotel. We know that smoke costs us a lot of money. Why not share it around? Why not provide a little bit for those guys? Okay? So the key thing then is 
give them an incentive not to burn. Buy the smoke from them before they burn by saying to them, if you don't burn, we'll pay you. But if you burn, no money. Okay? Just a real simple contingent thing. So what does this mean? It means paying the farmers to convert their crop waste instead of burning it. And how do they do that? They use this really simple do-it-yourself machine. Okay? That is literally an old oil barrel. And on top of it, that stripy stack on top there is just roofing sheet. Anybody can make this. Okay? I can make this. You can make this. You can buy it from us from almost nothing. Okay? This thing takes about an hour and a half for somebody to make with like three hand tools. Any farmer can make this with stuff that he's got lying around in the farm or that he can pick up in a roadside recycling place. If you use this as a way of getting rid of your, um, your corn crop waste, you make no smoke. Okay? Making this biochar is super charcoal, okay? And you make no smoke when you make it. You eliminate all of the greenhouse gases. You completely clean things up. And people like this stuff. You can buy, the, you can sell this stuff. So the farmer is going to get paid for it, right? How do we know all of this stuff? Because we've done it. Three years ago, when I first came to talk here, I was talking as we had this experiment going on. And we went up to Meijen, the biggest single source of smoke for all of Chiang And we said, okay, if this is the worst place to go, we're going to start there. We were really naive and stupid about that. Let me just tell you, that was a real eye-opener. But we went up there and said to them, hey, could we pay you if you did this? They looked at us like we were out of our minds, but they said, sure, you want to pay us? Be, bring it on. They were making four to six baht a kilo for their corn. We paid them two baht a kilo to do this, and they instantly started making us biochar. They made us 15,000 bags in a month and a half. We had to tell them to stop because we'd run out of money. Okay? So they would love to do it. Right now, we're back in Beijing. We're working around Prao where we currently live, right? Corn today is selling for five to seven by. Okay? Pretty good year this year as far as corn is concerned. We're paying five by per kilo for the biochar. That means that somebody can double the income from their field. Five by for the corn, five by for the waste. Ten by per unit, right? That is incredible for them. They now do not have to leave home and go down south. They can stay home, they can live in their own house, they can eat for less, they can stay with their family, and so on and so forth, and at the same time, make more money than they could possibly send from down south. Because the problem is, when you go down south, you discover you gotta find a place to live, you gotta find food to eat, you wanna buy a Chang every evening, you wanna buy cigarettes, there's not a lot of money left over to send home. So the poor women and kids and so on left back home, they don't get an awful lot. The, the hot season is a really tough season up in the countryside, okay? So, you know, these guys think this is great. We think it's great from a social point of view because imagine what happens to families when either the father or both the father and the mother leave six months a year. You want to understand where social dysfunction comes from? Where domestic violence and alcoholism and drugs and STDs come from? They come from six months a year of regular disruption of family structure. Okay? So why are you essential? Well, these guys can't do this unless there's somebody who can, in fact, begin to provide incentives. They need demand for this product. Demand comes in the form of people who want it, right? And there have to be, you know, therefore, incentives and demands that run together. We can provide the incentive because we're there, but if we don't have the money from the demand behind us, we can't do that. How, what do you get? Well, we can take this 
biochar, and we can make it into an incredibly effective, incredibly powerful fertilizer. This fertilizer is entirely organic. It produces better results than synthetic fertilizers. We've tested this in side-by-side -side plots with rice, where you get 10.8% more rice from the biochar field than you get from the synthetic field. The soil gets better, all sorts of great things happen. So it really, really, really works as a fertilizer, but also if you turn it into bricks. I know you guys cook on gas or electricity, but 65% of the people here in North Thailand, they cook on charcoal or firewood, right? Both of which smoke like hell all year long, right? And so one of the reasons we have such a high rate of infant mortality and so many old people die is because they're sitting constantly in houses that have no chimneys, sitting around little stoves, right, where they're burning charcoal or firewood that make huge amounts of smoke. If you've ever walked into an Acha household, it's like, <coughs> you can't see the fire. It's just, it's just unbelievable, right? And the, the baby's hanging over the mother's shoulder, right over the fire. The old folks are there all huddled up around that fire. You know, it's just immensely smoky. Those people are constantly, all year round, smoking this stuff. Alternatively, we can make a biochar briquette, which not only produce no smoke, to make the biochar, but produces zero smoke when burned, okay? No noxious gases. So you don't have a smoky house. You don't have infants breathing PM 2.5. You don't have old people drinking, breathing PM 2.5. And we can make it for exactly the same price as charcoal, okay? And furthermore, because it is made from crop oil, not wood, as is the case with charcoal. These people are not burning down our forests. They are not cutting down forest trees. They are not destroying habitat. They are not, therefore, destroying biodiversity. And they're not destroying watershed. So that you know the drought that we are engaged in today did not have to be this bad. Because if there were more forests here, there would certainly be more water reserves in the soil, in our rivers, and so on and so forth. So there's a tremendous virtue to pushing all of this along. And just so that you know, this isn't just you know some other product, right? Four Seasons today buys two tons a month of this stuff from us and uses it in their own barbecue things, okay? This is a really good product. They buy it because it's good, because it works, okay? The takeaway is only you can stop the fire. You gotta shut up, you gotta stop complaining, you gotta start doing something. And what you can do right away, okay, is create those incentives for these farmers to not burn but the biochar. And the way to do that is going to be to buy biochar containing products. You can buy biochar products from us directly. You can buy them in virtually every market around here. You can go to Rimping, you can go to Tops, wherever. You can buy biochar briquettes. You can buy biochar fertilizer. You can buy it from us. You can buy it from others. But please make a point of using biochar. Because whether we're making it or somebody else is making it, the making of it is actually moving smoke before it happens. The biochar that you are buying is like solid smoke, okay? So, let's get with it, okay? Let me just leave you with this. My wife is standing at the back there. We've got a table outside where some of our products are. But mainly, I need you to give us your names, your emails, and so on, so we can contact you, figure out how we can get products to you if you're interested, okay? And then if you just want to call and contact us, this is the information. English, that's me, Thai, that's my project manager from home, okay? 
And if anybody's got any questions, happy to answer them until they give me the hook, okay? Uh, good morning. One of the issues in Africa was that the sugar price was very high. A lot of the farms that started couldn't survive with the price went crashing down. Over the years, they've developed a way of using and recycling the waste, which is now they actually make more money from the waste than they do from sugar. Yeah. Is there a relationship between you and that organization, or could there be? Um, there is not at present. Our work focuses largely here in Thailand and largely focuses on corn waste. Um, the difficulty with sugar uh, cane itself is that the plantation owners burn the fields before they cut, right? So that the smoke problem from sugar cane comes from the burning of the leaves before they cut. Because the, in the sugar cane plantation, you have lots of snakes, tarantulas, uh, scorpions, and so on. And if you burn the field, then you don't, you know, your, your workforce isn't getting chomped up, right? Okay. Then once you've cut the cane, you take it to the mill, you squeeze it, and what's left over is called bagasse. And you can make all sorts of wonderful products out of, out of that. And in Thailand, there are a number of companies that are, that are doing that already. What I'm trying to figure out is, is there a way that we could stop the pre-burning? Or could we harvest some of that leaf stuff and turn it into something useful without all the smoke. But I don't know. I mean, in Thailand, sugarcane smoke used to be the primary source of smoke, and it's only in the last maybe decade been overtaken by corn as the primary source of smoke. But you're right. I mean, sugarcane is really fantastic stuff. I mean, it, it produces uh, uh, wonderful products. And there's some really great products that you can, for example, you can use them in your gardens. The, the compressed bagasse and poke holes that plant seeds in it. Really neat stuff, yeah. Sir? What's the relationship and how much sugar cane smoke does one kind of buy a chocolate Well, one ton of biochar requires, to make it, it requires five tons of crop waste. One ton of crop waste will produce six, six, call it six and a quarter kilograms of, uh, of smoke. So roughly one, one ton of biochar is the equivalent of about 32 plus kilograms of, um, of smoke, which is a lot. I know it doesn't sound like very much, but it's a lot. A normal farmer would get probably about one and a half um, one and a half tons of corn waste on a, on a single rod. And he would probably have three to five rods. So that's probably what he would be saving individually um, by participating in a program like this. I was, uh, I was told that the surrounding hills this, the fires are started by the people living up there because after the fire goes through, there's a mushroom that grows and a vegetable, and that's all crown land. Uh, is there anything to be done about that? Right. Well, there, here in Thailand, we have this unique situation where we, are, we have a lot of forest, and we do have this remarkable source of mushrooms in, in the forest. One of the impressions that a lot of people have is that the mushroom picking drives the forest fire. And it's pretty clear that there is a certain amount of forest fire lighting, which is specifically related to the mushrooms. Um, there are big debates about what portion of the total forest fire coverage comes from mushrooms. Um, some of the uh, imagery that we see, all the imagery that you see on the, on the internet is the free NASA study. If you look at the higher resolution NASA images, which you have to pay for, 
what you see in the when you see the picture of the forest around us is that it looks like Swiss cheese. There are thousands and thousands of tiny corn farms inside the forest. And most of the fires seem to start from those farms. So they'll burn the field and the fire then spreads out. And according to a university study done by May Falong, the only place they ever observe hot spots disappearing is where farmers switch from growing corn to coffee, corn to tea, or corn to some other crop that they wanted to protect from fires, right? Um, now, that does not mean that there is not a problem around mushrooms. There are two sources of burning related to mushrooms. One has to do with forest people burning because if you get mushrooms, I mean, if you've ever been out in the forest around here, you know that it's just this brown leaf litter everywhere, right? It's very hard to see these little morels and, and head caught mushrooms, right? They're only about this tall. And if they're covered with leaves, they're very hard to find. On the other hand, if you light a fire and it burns away, you get this nice black, flat surface, it's really easy to pick them up, okay? They're worth a fortune in sales to China and Japan, okay? So even a bad picker can probably make five, even 10,000 baht a day picking morels that way, okay? Now, this is in an area where the average family, family of four, makes probably 2,700 baht a month. So you can see the financial incentive that drives the very poor. The other thing that happens is that the big companies that sell mushrooms to China, where you get shot, and for shot for real, if you pick mushrooms in the forest, um, the companies that sell uh, fresh Thai mushrooms to China um, pay people to go light fires. So, there's a symbiotic relation, let's say, between the big companies and the government and so on, big companies and the fire, because a lot of the land that is currently cornland was once forest. It all belongs technically to the king. The officials turn a blind eye to forests that gets deliberately burned as long as it is then planted with contract corn. So, you know, it's very hard here to sort out where the responsibility lies for our smoke problem. But I suspect we could do everything in our power and probably not affect things very much until there are some very fundamental changes elsewhere over which we have no control. How much did one of these uh, furnaces the kind that I had a picture of here um, runs about 1,500 baht. It's very good for chunky materials like big chips of wood, if you've got a wood chipper, um, for corn, corn cobs. Um, if you've got branches in your yard that you can break up and so on. Um, better if you want to do branches that have fallen down, or bamboo would be a longer thing. If you go to our website, you'll see instructions and pictures about all of them and so on. Um, but there are different ways of making biochar. What we've tried to do is to design different machines for different materials, different feedstocks, to minimize the amount of work that farmers have to do. Farmers are, in fact, very lazy. And if you say to them, we want you to use this machine, but oh, by the way, you have to do a lot of cutting to get your stuff into it, they'll just say, forget it, not interested, right? But on the other hand, if you give them something and say, oh, just chuck the stuff in, it'll work, no problem. So, well, what happens on corn cob is that they all, the corn dries on the stalk. Then they harvest it by everybody going through the field, picking and putting it in a bag, 
chucking into the back of the pickup truck. And this whole caravan of pickup trucks would come down the mountain and stop where somebody's got a great big truck with a deep kernel on the back of it. And they just feed this stuff into the back. And it makes an immense amount of noise. And there's a big spout. And out of that spout comes a huge flow of first husk, which flutters down, and then the cobs, which go further. And out the side comes this little river of, of kernel, OK? And these piles are like as big as this room and four times as high. And when they get too big, they just burn them. But, but that's, that's the system for corn. For cutting corn stalks in the field, that's a real dog. You got a guy out there with a weed whacker working up and down the hill, dragging stuff down the mountain. It's, that's real work. Um, we've done uh, dead bamboo for, temp for temples where you have to cut it, pull the bamboo apart and so on. Uh, branches, you know, if you've got a big yard, for example, and your trees shed branches all year long, you don't want to have to cut those branches up. And you also don't want to try and stuff them into a barrel like this. Because they're, they're, you know, they're all wiggly. By the time you've stuffed 10, 10 branches in, the thing seems full. You're not going to go out biochar or something like that. But if you've got a long one, you can just keep chunking them in until you're out of it. It works great. So. How many, how many of these? A lot of our farmers use about 10 each. 10 each. So one guy can manage 10 barrels at a time. So in a lot of places, we've got kids who've got 10, and they're making a fortune running micro business with 10 of them. Thank you, Michael. Hey, listen, uh, just a couple of reminders for you guys. I've got my discounts for the morning. Clay, 